So we got just a, a short video clip that we're going to show you, and then I have a short message, not a long message today. But today I want to talk about, and I think it would be a good message for today, is honoring your mother and father. Amen? And we're going to do that message today. It's the fifth of, of the Ten Commandments. And so we're going to watch a video, and then we're going to move on with our thing. The fifth of the Ten Commandments reads, Honor your father and your mother. This commandment is so important that it is one of the only commandments in the entire Bible that gives a reason for observing it. That your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Many people read that part of the fifth commandment as a reward. But while it may be regarded as a reward, the fact remains that it is a reason. If you build a society in which children honor their parents, your society will long survive. And the corollary is, a society in which children do not honor their parents is doomed to self-destruction. In our time, this connection between honoring parents and maintaining civilization is not widely recognized. On the contrary, many of the best educated parents do not believe that their children need to show them honor since honoring implies an authority figure, and that is a status many modern parents reject. In addition, many parents seek to be loved, not honored, by their children. Yet neither the Ten Commandments nor the Bible elsewhere commands us to love our parents. This is particularly striking given that the Bible commands us to love our neighbor, to love God, and to love the stranger. The Bible understands that there will always be individuals who, for whatever reason, do not love a parent. Therefore, it does not demand what may be psychologically or emotionally impossible, but it does demand that we show honor to our parents. And it makes this demand only with regard to parents. There is no one else who the Bible commands us to honor. So then, why is honoring parents so important? Why does the Ten Commandments believe that society could not survive if this commandment were widely violated? One reason is that we as children need it. Parents may want to be honored, and they should want to be, but children need to honor parents. A father and a mother who are not honored are essentially adult peers of their children. They are not parents. No generation knows better than ours the terrible consequences of growing up without a father. Fatherless boys are far more likely to grow up and commit violent crime, mistreat women, and act out against society in every other way. Girls who do not have a father to honor, and hopefully to love as well, are more likely to seek the wrong men and to be promiscuous at an early age. Second, Honoring parents is how nearly all of us come to recognize that there is a moral authority above us to whom we are morally accountable. And without this, we cannot create or maintain a moral society. Of course, for the Ten Commandments, the ultimate moral authority is God, who is therefore higher than even our parents. But it is very difficult to come to honor God without having had a parent, especially a father, to honor. Sigmund Freud, the father of psychiatry and an atheist, theorized that one's attitude towards one's father largely shaped one's attitude toward God. There's one more reason why honoring parents is fundamental to a good society. Honoring parents is the best antidote to totalitarianism. One of the first things totalitarian movements seek to do is to break the child-parent bond. A child's allegiance is shifted from parents to the state. Even in democratic societies, the larger the state becomes, the more it usurps the parental role. Finally, there are many ways to honor parents. The general rule is this. They get special treatment. Parents are unique, so they must be treated in a unique way. You don't talk to them in quite the same way you do anyone else. For example, you might use expletives when speaking to a friend, but you don't with a parent. You don't call them by their first name. 
And when you leave their home and make your own, you maintain contact with them. Having no contact with parents is the opposite of honoring them. And yes, we all recognize that some parents have behaved so cruelly, and I mean cruelly, not annoyingly, that one finds it morally impossible to honor them. There are such cases, but they are rare. And remember this, if your children see you honor your parents, no matter how difficult it may sometimes be, the chances are far greater that they will honor you. I'm Dennis Prager. Join Prager University, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and sign up for free at PragerU.com. Amen. There we go. Amen. How many enjoyed that little video? Some truth. Amen. And so I wanted to start this morning in, in talking about honor. The word honor means to, high, to have high esteem or to have respect. Amen. How many know that sometimes in society we don't see that too much today? But it's, it's to, to, to esteem highly and to respect. And I wanted to just start uh, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. This is one of the big ten. Say the big ten. Amen? God's top ten. This is the Ten Commandments. And people think sometimes that the Ten Commandments is old-fashioned. I like what Robert Moore says. The Ten Commandments is actually well-fashioned. Amen? It keeps us on the straight and narrow. It sets up uh, perimeters for our lives and how to live a right life. Amen? Uh, there's, there's nothing legalistic about the Ten Commandments. How many here would like someone to steal from you? Right? How many here who are married would like someone to sleep with your spouse? I mean, no, no. How many would like someone to lie to you? No. The Ten Commandments are good. Amen? They're, they're right. And so uh, the Bible says here, Honor in Exodus 20, verse 12, Honor your father and your mother, that the day, your days may be long on the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So this is one of the fifth of the Ten Commandments. And it's very important because fathers and mothers are the first authority figures in a child's life. Amen? And so those society, like we just saw in the video, wants to kind of, you know, promote the fact that you need to be your kid's friend and you don't want to be an authority figure. That's wrong theology because you, if you don't teach your children to rec recognize and respect authority, chances are they'll never respect and recognize God's authority. Amen? And so there's a way to love your children but still demand respect. Amen? Amen? It's important to teach and model honor to our children. And, uh, and, and one of the reasons is because it is the first commandment, say the first, with a promise attached to it. So God wants to bless us, and he will bless us when we keep this commandment. And the other reason why we want to teach our children honor is because honor produces faith. You cannot be a person of faith if you don't understand what honor is. Is honor is very, very important. Mark chapter 6, verse 1 to 6. I want to share a passage of scripture here where Jesus is in his ministry, okay, and he's uh, got his disciples with him and he's going home. And, and it says here in Mark chapter 6, verse 1 to 6, then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, okay. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this that has been given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hand? So they were astonished at the wisdom and the miracles that this man, Jesus, was able to perform. They were marveling. They're like, Who? What? This is amazing. This, 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 this Jesus, look what he's doing. But the next verse kind of blows me away because it kind of... Uh, it, it kind of messes up the story here. Verse 3. They recognize all of a sudden, it says, is this not the carpenter? Uh, and it's very interesting that it doesn't say, is this not a carpenter? It says, is this not the town carpenter? Amen? Like the town plumber, the town dentist, right? They knew him. He had a reputation in the flesh, in the natural. He was a carpenter. Okay, he's the son of Mary. He, his brother is James and Josie and Ju Judas and Simon. Are these not his sisters that are here with us? Right? So they were offended at him. All of us, they see all these miracles happening. They, they're marveling at the wisdom that is coming out of this man. And suddenly, they're offended. How many have heard the statement, familiarity breeds contempt? 
And it's so true, you know. Fami uh, the, the word actual, the word familiar comes from the word family. And so as you get familiar with someone, the, the person you're most familiar with is probably a family member, amen, or family members. And the thing is, when you get familiar with people, you begin to, you, you see their strengths and their gifts, you see the positive, but you also see the blind spots, the weaknesses, and the faults. And it's human nature to focus in on the negative and not the positive. How many hear what I'm saying? Okay. Um, and so when you focus on people's blind spots and their weaknesses and their faults, what happens is um, you dishonor them. Amen? And look what Jesus says in the next verse, verse 4. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives in his own house. And now he, he could do no mighty works there in Nazareth, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Uh, then he, he went about the village in the circuit teaching. And so what Jesus was saying is, listen, a prophet has honor everywhere else, but in his own house. You know, when I was in Oshawa, when we were part of David Youngren's church in Oshawa, he had a church a little bigger than our church, but it wasn't a huge church. And uh, he would he would he would show us videos because he'd go over to he'd go over to Africa, and there would be he'd show us videos. He'd be up preaching, and there'd be a hundred, hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand people coming. And there was the crowds were humongous because the people in Africa are not familiar with David Younger, and they see this poster of a six foot four white guy with a Bible, and they say he must be a man of God. Let's go and hear the man of God. And so they'd come, and they weren't familiar with David. And David would come up, and he would preach, and people would get healed, and miracles would happen, and blind eyes would open. Why? Because there's faith that's born when, when you look at God in people instead of being familiar with their faults. And then David would come back, and he'd preach and struggle with, you know, rebellion in the church and everything else. No one respected him. No, I'm just... People respect him, but there was more issues because when you get familiar, you get to pick at the issues. Amen? And so, so this is kind of a little analogy. It's harder for people to, uh, that you're close to, all right, to honor. And that's why it's in the Ten Commandments. You're the closest to your parents. You need to honor your mother and father. Yes, you're going to see their faults. Yes, you're going to see their blind spots. Yes, you're going to see the issues in their life. But we still need to honor. It's a commandment. Amen? And uh, the reason why, okay, it's harder to honor is because we evaluate people after the flesh. I want you to look at the person beside you and say, you're only human. <laughs> and as we get to, see, get to know people, we say, yeah, yeah, I know their faults. And, and the next thing you know, you move away from seeing the Christ in them. Instead of seeing the greatness in them, you begin to see their faults. Because we tend to, human nature is, we always tend to look at the flaws in people and the faults. And we elevate them instead of looking at Christ in them, the hope of glory. And if we don't honor the person next to us, God can't use that person to bring a miracle into your life. Because you're looking at their imperfections instead of looking at the glory of God in them. How many know I'm not perfect? How many know you're not perfect? Amen? But we thank God for the glory of God. Amen? In order to honor people, we need to see from heaven's perspective, not from the human perspective. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. I want you to look at the person beside you. You're only human, but you're a royal priesthood. Amen? So we have to look from heaven's perspective, okay? A holy nation, his own special people. See, you are special to God. The person sitting beside you is special to God. And when you take time to, to care for that person in their faults and in their weaknesses and in their blind spots, you honor them. What you're doing is you're honoring God because the person beside you is a daughter or a son of God. Amen? And so honor is so important. Honor is key. I want to say this. Jesus was sinless. Say he was sinless. But he wasn't perfect. In people's perspective, he wasn't perfect. Because they were expecting him to come as a king, and he came as a servant. They got a carpenter instead of a king. They wanted someone who was rich, and he came poor. They wanted someone who was a warrior, but he came as a counselor and a friend. And so he wasn't perfect to them. 
he was perfect. Amen. I heard everyone was like, oh, he's a, let's get a stone. Is there a stone around here? I'm going to throw a stone at the preacher. He was perfect, but in their minds, he didn't come the way they wanted him to come. Amen. So, so because he wasn't perfect, they were offended. They said, you can't be the Messiah. You're a carpenter. You came and you were working in my kitchen. You built a cupboard and I heard you burp. You're only human. I made, and my mama made you falafel. You remember that day last, you know, last month and we were doing the kitchen and stuff and we were chatting and laughing together. You can't be the Messiah because you should have came from the temple and you should have been to Bible school and you should have did this and you should have came in this fashion and you didn't come the way I expected you to come. You know, the person sitting beside you isn't going to come the way you expect them to come, but they're still God's gift to you. Amen? And so the Bible says he could do no mighty works there. Why? Because dishonor produces unbelief. When you dishonor someone, it's, it's a form of, it produces in your life unbelief. But the other thing is that honor produces faith. How many, how many want some faith? Amen. Honor will produce faith in your life. I want to look at another story. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 to 18 says, and this is what Paul is saying concerning him and some of the other disciples. He says, so we have stopped evaluating people, others, from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. Jesus is no longer limited to flesh. Now he's all-powerful. He's returned to his state, right? He was limited by flesh. He was fully God, but also fully man. Now he's released the man as... He's still fully man, fully God, but we see him from a different perspective. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And I want you to look at the person beside you and say, I see Christ in you. I can focus on your blind spots, but I'd rather focus on Jesus. Amen? God is good. In Luke chapter 7, I'm going to show you the, the flip situation. Luke chapter 7, verse 1 to 10. When Jesus had finished saying all these things to the people, he returned to Capernaum. At that time, the, the highly, sorry, at, the, at that time, the highly valued slave of a Roman officer was sick and near death. When the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some of the respectful Jewish elders, okay? to ask him to come and heal his slave. So they earnestly begged Jesus to help the man. If anyone deserves your help, this man does, he said, for he loves the Jewish people and he even built a synagogue for us. So we want to, we want to help this Roman centurion, okay? So Jesus went with them, but just before they arrived at the house, the officer sent some friends saying, Lord, don't trouble yourself, okay, by coming to my home, for I am not worthy of such an honor. So, in the last passage of Scripture, Jesus comes home, and they are scratching their heads going, well, he's just the carpenter, so it can't be God. Or, we're offended because, you know, why would God use him? And God could not do any mighty works. But look what happens here. Okay? I'm not even worthy to come and meet you. Just say the word from where you are. My servant will be healed. I know this because I'm under authority as... Uh, the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say, go, and they go, come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. And then Jesus heard this. He was amazed, turning to the crowd that was following him, and he said, I tell you, I have not seen such faith like this in all of Israel. Honor produces faith. Dishonor produces unbelief. Here was a man who understood the authority that was in Jesus. He was the Son of God. He, he saw the power, and he wasn't familiar with Jesus like those people were. All right, so number one. Say number one. Honor produces faith. Say number two. Honor produces blessing. Okay? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 to 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Okay? Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Okay, I know that guy said it's, it's more of a result than a promise, but it's still a promise, okay? Uh, that it may be well with you and you will live long on the earth. And so there's two promises attached to this verse. Number one, that, it will, that life will go well for you. And then number two, that you'll live long on the earth. I don't want to live long on the earth if life isn't going well. 
Amen? If I'm all crippled up in a wheelchair, or, you know, just, you know, not, not doing well, like, you know, you know, my bank account, my kids hate me, you know, that. If things aren't going well, who wants to live long? Nobody does, right? But, but I want, to, the Bible says the promise is that life will go well with you. Say, life will go well with me, and I'll live long on the earth. Amen? And so, here's the thing. If you don't teach your children to honor, if we don't teach our children to honor, they will not learn to honor their bosses. They will not learn to honor their leaders. And things will not go well with them. But as, as parents, if we train our children to honor, and say, because everybody wants to be their kid's friend. But that's not the most important thing. We've got to love our children, but we need to be the boss, big boss man, amen? You have to be the one who, you have to teach honor, because if you don't, we have a whole generation of young people that can't hold jobs anymore. They come in and they're disrespectful, they're dishonoring, they're late all the time. How, how many know what I'm talking about? It's a major crisis, and everyone who owns a business, hands flying up, right? It's a major crisis we've run into now because we've been teaching that society that we don't want to create authority figures. You're going to damage your kid. No, they need to understand authority because in, in order to be in authority, you have to be under authority. And if you can't submit to a boss, you, nobody's going to submit to you. The farther we get away from the Bible, the more insanity we see, and I, I just see that so, so clearly. Okay? Our society doesn't honor, and I see this even in the church with, in the realm of the political realm, bad-mouthing politicians, and as Christians, we should be different. Amen? And I'm okay to say, when I look at a politician or the leader and say, I don't agree with what's, what's being done, but you know what? We're going to pray for that leader. We're going to pray that God gets a hold of Justin Trudeau. We're going to pray that his heart gets changed. and We're going to intercede for him because we, we don't agree with what he's doing. It's okay. But there's a way of sharing truth without dishonoring leadership. Amen? And I see Christians do that, especially you see it on Facebook, bad-mouthing, saying mean things and degrading things. The world does that. We should not do that. Blessings and cursings should not come out of the same fountain. Amen? Amen. So we pray, Lord, bless him, change him, transform him. And if he's not willing, remove him. But we still need to honor. Amen? We have to have honor in our lips, okay? Honor produces blessings. Can I keep going? Okay, let's keep moving then. Okay, Romans chapter 13 Verse 1 to 2, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists the ordinances of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. And I want to say this first and foremost, unless uh, there's something contrary to Scripture, if there's something being taught contrary to Scripture, of course you don't obey, because you, God is first, amen? But I'm talking about in general, we have to have an honoring, submissive, attitude towards governing authorities. Amen? And if we don't, it brings judgment. In Luke chapter 52, 2 verse 52, it says, in Jesus, and I want to say this word subject that we just read, the word subject it means obedience. Say obedience. We see the same word used in Luke chapter 2 verse 52. It says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in the favor with God and with men. Isn't that awesome? How many want to increase in wisdom and stature and favor with God? Amen. But what does the verse say before that? The verse before that says, And he went down with them, being his parents, came to Nazareth, and was subject to them. The same word, obedient. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. And because of his obedience, he fulfilled number five of the Ten Commandments, and it went well with him. Next verse tells us. Everything's linked to obedience. So, God lists some uh, d disobedience to parents um, throughout the scripture. And I, I don't really have time to get into them, so I'm going to pass them. But there's a whole bunch of scriptures talking about disobedience to parents and dishonoring parents in the Old Testament. Say, thank God I don't live in the Old Testament. Right? It was, you know, stone the, parent, stone the kids that disrespect their parents. But we're not going to get into that because we're New Testament saints. No stones around here. No stones under the chairs. Good. Okay. Good. Um, but God lists disobedience to parents with all the bad, bad sins. The really bad sins. Okay. And we see that in Romans chapter 1, verse 30. There's a whole list of the things that we consider unrighteous. But Romans chapter 1, verse 30 says, Those who are backbiters, haters of God, 
violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Amen? Disobedience to parents, God looks down at as really bad. Amen? And uh, we see again in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, talking about the end days and how people will be lovers of... It says here, um, For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. Amen? Amen. And uh, if, you, if you do some research, you'll see that when Hitler was in power in Germany, one of the strategies they had, they, and they still do it today at, to a lesser extent, but propaganda. They would get the kids in the classrooms, and they would teach their child, the kids in the classroom, listen, if your parents disagree with communism and where we're going as a country and me as a leader, you need to turn them in. And kids were turning their parents in. They were more loyal to the state than they were to their parents. Amen? And that's what the enemy's strategy is, is to divide and conquer the family. Hallelujah. That's why it's important you vote. <laughs> okay? Make sure that those that you are voting for the right person. Okay? Proverbs chapter 30, verse 11 to 17. Um, we're going we're gonna to pass that for time's sake, I think. Or should we do it? Should we do it? Yeah. Okay, we're going to do it. Proverbs chapter 30, 11 to 13. Some people... And in the King James, I'm reading out of the New Living, but the King James says generations, okay? So, some generations curse their father and do not thank their mother. They are pure in their own eyes, okay? But they are filthy and unwashed. They look proudly around, casting disdainful glances, means there's pride. They have teeth like swords, means they're talking. How many people talk bad and cut people up and backbite and gossip? Fangs like knives, they devour the poor from the earth and the needy from among humanity. Verse 15, the leech has two suckers, say two suckers, that cry out, more, more. There's never enough. There are three things that are never satisfied, no four that never say enough, the grave, the barren womb, the thirsty desert, and the blazing fire. Verse 17, the eye that mocks a father and despises a mother's instruction will be plucked out by ravens of the valley and eaten by vultures. Like God hates this stuff. Okay. Now look at this. Leeches... We, we're talking about a, a generation of entitlement, right? And, you know, I, and what I hear, too, when talking to high school kids, is, and they're all going on about socialism is the way to go. Social, well, hey, we don't want to get into politics at the pulpit here, but I will say this. It's not all about you, amen? You need to work. You have to honor. You have to, you know, build your life, Amen. But there's this whole thing, this, this generation of entitlement. And if you do not teach honor to your children, there'll be an entitlement attitude that will get in your lineage and affect generations down the road. Amen? Yeah. Honor is so important. And lastly, number three, say number three, honor produces destiny. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, 16, we see this... Um, it says, honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days will be long, and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. God has given you a place of promise. God has a promised land for you this side of the grave. We talk about the promised land like it's heaven, but this side of the grave, God has prepared a place for you to be living the victorious life, where you're no longer, you're no longer battling fear. You're no longer battling depression. You're, no, you, you've, you have, you're living the victorious life. Amen? God wants you to live victorious this side of the grave. Amen? Because in the promised land, which is an allegory in the Old Testament, there was always giants in the land, and they had to go and conquer. You don't have to conquer giants in heaven. You're not going to get to heaven and have to you know, fight your way to position. No, God has called you to a place. He has a destiny. He has a purpose for you in the earth now. And, and, and God has given it to you. And if you learn honor, it'll come a lot faster. Amen? Amen. And, you know, obviously, maybe some of you have had parents who've hurt you, uh, who have been very dishonorable. And we don't take that lightly because sometimes that has happened. And the way you deal with that is, as a believer, you have to make a choice. Even when your emotions don't line up, even though everything in you wants to see justice, you have to look at the cross and say, Jesus, when they, when they were mocking you and spitting on you, you chose to go to the cross and you said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And as Christians, where you are now, you have to think back over your childhood and you have to do this thing called separation. 
You have to separate and say, well, did they have good Bible teaching like I had? Did they go to an encounter weekend? Did they have the Holy Ghost? Did, did they have, and so they were bound by the devil, and what they did was wrong, but I'm going to choose to forgive them, for they did not know ultimately what they were doing, and I choose today to forgive them, and God, I ask you to help me to, you know, connect my heart with this, because right now I don't want to, but Lord, I'm making a choice, and a burden will lift off of you, amen? And so I just, I just really wanted to finish with that because I do know that maybe some of you have been hurt by your parents. But that's something as well um, that you can do. Because your story will be able to bring healing to others. Yes. Amen? Who have gone through traumatic stuff. You know? What does it look like to honor somebody? In closing, I'll say this. Don't focus on their humanity. Focus on how God sees them. Look at the person beside you and go, you're, and if it's a girl, you say daughter. If it's a guy, you say son, okay? Say, you're a daughter or son of God. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Well, let's stand together, and we're going to close. I'm going to ask Don to come up. We're going to close with a bang. We're going we're to finish with our song. How many received something from God today? Good? Awesome. So dishonor causes what? Unbelief. And honor causes faith. Amen? So we've got to be people of honor. I um, just uh, wanted to put this out here. Um, if you want to accept the Lord, for the, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you want to accept the Lord today. Today is the day of salvation. I'll be up here to pray with you. But if you're in this place and you just, this message is kind of, you know, hit you because you, you're really struggling with maybe some dishonor you received from parents and you want to forgive them. You need someone to help you do that. You need someone to help pray with you. Um, we're going to have our prayer team. As I've already talked to them. They're going to be up here. They want to pray with you. They want to help you to, to somehow honor something in your parents. Amen? And so we, we want to uh, make that available. So if you need prayer after the worship here, just come up and we'll pray with you. Amen? God is good. Well, Father, I thank you for this word that went forward today, Lord. I thank you, God, that you would teach us to honor. You would teach us to um, be people who train our children to honor in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen.